So hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Komi Fai. I am the Director of Faculty Outreach at FIRE. Um, today's guest is Amy Wax. Amy Wax is the Robert Munheim Professor of Law at the University of Pennsylvania. She holds a Bachelor of Science degree from Yale University, an MD from Harvard University, and a law degree from Columbia University. From 1988 to 1994, she served as the Assistant to the Solicitor General in the U.S. Department of Justice, where she argued 15 cases before the United States Supreme Court. Her published work addresses a wide range of issues in social welfare law and policy, including the relationship with the family, the workplace, and labor markets. She is the author of the book, Race, Wrongs, and Remedies, Group Justice in the 21st Century, published by the Hoover Institution Press and Roman and Littlefield in 2009. In a few moments, uh, Professor Wax will spend about 20 minutes presenting her case for why the various allegations against her are unfounded. Then, for the remaining hour of this event, all of you who are present um, will be able to address Professor Wax directly, asking questions, disputing her arguments, etc. And I request you please use the raise your hand feature in Zoom, and that way I can unmute you and so you can ask your question directly. Um, you're welcome to say absolutely anything you'd like to Professor Wax. Um, I only ask that you keep your questions and comments to about 15 seconds each, um, only to ensure the faculty can ask um, as many questions as possible. I do want to make sure people can have some of a dialogue back and forth, um, so you are welcome to ask follow-up questions, um, but I just want you to be mindful that there will be many faculty who will likely want to talk to Professor Wax, Professor Wax directly. Um, you can also submit your questions um, anonymously if you so choose, and I will read them aloud. Uh, finally, and just as a heads up, this webinar is being recorded and is likely going to be reported on by various news outlets. And with that, um, with that covered, Professor Wax, um, please proceed to present your case. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here addressing uh, this uh, group, this distinguished group. Uh, and I want to uh, keep this presentation as brief as possible because I know it's important to have a real dialogue and discussion and answer questions. Uh, so I am here because I've been invited to address allegations in a recent New York Times article and just to comment generally on the charges that have been brought against me by my dean, Ted Ruger, at Penn Law School. Uh, accusing me of so-called behavioral violations and seeking major sanctions against me, which is sort of ill-defined, but be, can be anything from a slap on the wrist to stripping me of tenure and taking away my job. Uh, so before I get to uh, the focus of what FIRE wanted me to talk about, which is my alleged uh, in-school comments, uh, I just want to make a couple of brief general points. The first is just about the media coverage that my case has gotten. Uh, I've really been disappointed, at some point shocked, by the media coverage. I guess I'm naive. Uh, in general, the mainstream media coverage has been uh, agenda-driven. This is uh, not surprising, I guess, because uh, right-leaning dissenters like me are not terribly popular. Uh, but in specific, the coverage has been very superficial, very careless, and leaves out abundant information favorable to me. And I'm just going to give a couple of examples from the New York Times article. The first is um, there was a report commissioned by Penn Law by Professor Dan Rodriguez of Northwestern University uh, a little more than a year ago. And the New York Times utterly failed to discuss uh, the most important findings in this report. Uh, in particular, Dan Rodriguez found that there was no evidence, no objective evidence of my bias towards any students or in my evaluation of students. And he also noted that Penn Law has blind grading and that I had adhered to the requirements of blind grading. Uh, and yet the law school continues to accuse me of bias, of discrimination, of saying the students have reason to think I'm biased. The law school basically ignores this report, and indeed for eight months it was kept from me. Uh, they didn't even tell me that it existed. Uh, so that shows rank dishonesty and a complete lack of intellectual integrity by the law school and by the media reporting on this story. 
Also, uh, the stories in the mainstream media either fail to mention or give no attention to my getting a big university-wide teaching prize, the Lindbach Prize, in 2015. And for that prize, my entire record was scrutinized in detail, gone over with a fine-tooth comb, and there was no evidence of bias or discrimination or other untoward behavior found uh, for that prize and if there had been I wouldn't have gotten it and indeed my teaching and my interactions with students were praised to the sky. Uh, so they would have done well to quote from some of these enconiums but of course they never got around to it. Now Ms. Comey, the fire people who invited me here, indicated that the discussion should center on my interactions with students because Everyone who participates knows that my extramural speech, my podcasts, my writing, things that I said and wrote outside the school is fully protected. And any university that claims to respect free expression understands that as a bedrock principle. But alas, that is not true of Penn. It is not true of my law school and my dean. They are trying to hang me almost entirely on my extramural speech. That is 95% of the charging indictment that has been filed against me. And make no mistake, the goal and effect of these charges is to demolish, to totally gut the protections for extramural free speech and free faculty expression and to drive dissenters like me out of the academy. And how do they uh, support doing that? by a very cynical trick that goes as follows and that is worthy of discussion. This professor's speech, mine, is really behavior, not speech. It disturbs and upsets students. They are thereby harmed by it and that prevents them from learning from that professor. Ergo, the professor is unfit to teach Therefore, the professor must be fired. And that is the argument. Now, notice how this sequence, this trick, expression is really behavior and it's harmful behavior, sets up students' subjective emotional responses as the final test, the only test of what professors can say. This is a subjective heckler's veto defined by students whims by their emotional reaction for any faculty speech. In the words of Jonathan Zimmerman, this is a rule of emotional blackmail. And of course, it is the protected categories of students, the special students, frankly, the ones I find to be the most indifferent or even hostile to free speech principles, who will tend to use this advice to get the people they disagree with to tar and target the professors that they disagree with, with full university approval. So that is my dean's position in a nutshell. His emphasis on untutored student reactions to the detriment of the core academic mission and diversity of thought, that is at the core of the indictment against me. Now the question is whether my dean will get away with this this remains to be seen. Of course, there is the faculty senate. They make the ultimate decision, and hopefully they will pull back from the brink, which is where the people on this Zoom come in. Everyone here should be extremely alarmed and concerned by what Penn is doing and should speak out against it. Now, you may think it won't happen to me. I don't say anything politically incorrect, but guess again. There is always someone who can take offense at something, and every teacher is vulnerable. This is a dangerous and revolutionary situation. So now I am go on, going to go on and talk about the charges against me involving statements at Penn or to students, as reported in the media. And there are really only three incidents in the New York Times article that are even worth addressing, right? Uh, it's unclear whether there will be any other. Penn has been very coy and very uninformative 
uh, about what in the end they are really going to charge me with and I can talk more about that and how unprofessional that is. So let's start with the first. Supposedly I said to a student at one point, well you only got into Ivy League schools because of affirmative action. Now let's step back and think about that statement. First of all, the student who made the allegation, who I don't remember at all, graduated in 2012. That's more than 10 years ago. There is no other record of a complaint of a personal remark like that that I ever made to a student in my 30 years of teaching. And indeed, I deny that I ever made such a remark. I just don't talk that way. Right? Unless students consult me directly in a personal way, and they do that sometimes, I just don't make such remarks. Few details are provided. When did I make it? In what context? At first it was at some kind of gathering. What kind of gathering? But the real bottom line here is that it is an isolated incident. It is very implausible that I made this statement, but even if I did, it's a one-off. Anyway, it wouldn't even be close to harassment under a legal definition, and frankly falls far short of any workable standard a university can have. But I really want to make a broader point here, and once again I want to clarify that I deny having made this statement. Is it really so racist? so harmful, so traumatizing, I submit to you that that extreme reaction doesn't make any sense. It doesn't pass the smell test. In the Ivies at Penn Law and other universities like it, affirmative action is celebrated, is embraced. It is viewed as indispensable to diversity, which is the highest good. And without it, diversity would be much reduced. If you doubt that, just take a look at the briefs in the Harvard Affirmative Action case. Blacks will be, the number of blacks will be minuscule without affirmative action. So is it so biased and racist to even suggest that someone has benefited from it? Why would it be if such a positive, important policy is of paramount uh, priority, right? Why such a negative reaction? In fact, if you think about it, here is what the far left on campus is doing. It is imposing a strange, incoherent rule on us, on what we can say and assert that makes no sense. And of course, that is the mark of tyranny, and we meekly go along. The rule is love affirmative action, affirm affirmative action, but never imply that anyone is admitted under affirmative action. Affirmative action is absolutely indispensable, but nobody benefits from it. Well, this is totally phony, right? This is a set of rules that should be challenged and questioned. The second incident, my colleague Tobias Wolf, a gay professor, he accuses me of homophobia and bigotry. I said some negative things about gay people about gay people as parents, that's the allegation. Now here's some background about what really happened. In 2005, I wrote an article called The Conservative's Dilemma. It was an article in which I tried to marshal and gather and summarize all the arguments against gay marriage that were essentially secular. I put aside the religious objections to gay marriage, and I said, what is the secular case against gay marriage? Now, Obergefell, which mandated gay marriage be recognized, wasn't decided till 2015, so there was a 10-year interval between my article and Obergefell when the pros and cons of gay marriage was the subject of robust debate, and that produced many invitations for me to come and talk about my article, right? And in fact, the statements that he purportedly object to were statements 
that I made at an invited academic event at Penn Law, a panel which was one of many in which I was asked to present the arguments in my article, arguments that I didn't necessarily all agree with, but some of which related to the process of gay couples having children, right? Which almost always involved some kind of uh, extramarital artificial uh, techniques, which necessarily entailed children being brought up without one of their natural parents and all the rest, and therefore generating some concern on the part of some people. Now, 10 years later, comes Tobias Wolf and says, Amy Wack said some stuff at this academic presentation that was a personal insult. It's directed at me. It harms me. It's demeaning. Now, I'm sorry to say, to perform that trick is solipsistic and childish and cynical. Tobias Wolf is trying to turn a valid academic presentation into an instance of bigotry. Should we allow him to do that? Consider the consequences. Academic presentations have to be submitted for approval. There have to be this set of rules and you have to comply with them. Perhaps Tobias Wolf would supply us with a list of the arguments that are allowed to be made and not allowed to be made, of course, in retrospect. And, you know, here I am labeled a homophobe and a bigot based on my academic activities. And this is listed as one of the grounds for sanctioning me to the point of taking away my job. Do we really want to live in that world? Third incident, it is claimed once again with very few details, no date given, that at some gathering, which of course, once again, I don't remember, it was a very long time ago, I'm sure, many years, uh, we went around the room at a lunch or some other event, students gave their names, and I was uh, accused of saying something like, Ah, finally an American. That's a good thing. Here's a little background on that allegation. Over the years, I have several times asked students to forgive me for mangling exotic names. I'm not very good with them. So if anything happened, I would guess likely what happened is I said, finally an American name. I confess that I would say stuff like that. Ah, but by dropping one little word, the allegation transforms the meaning and the gist of what I said to make me look as bad as possible. And that is the sort of little dishonest slippage that occurs routinely in these allegations because the priority here is get wax, we don't like her opinions, we don't like her views, and perhaps we will remember some incident that makes her look really bad. Now, I would just step back from this anecdote and say, well, is it really that bad? Maybe it was if I made it and I deny making it a flippant remark. But in fact, it is perfectly legitimate for people to be of the opinion, and I know people who are of the opinion, that universities, which are heavily funded by taxpayer dollars, are American universities, should primarily educate American citizens. There is nothing wrong with that opinion. Uh, one could argue it pro or con, but it's certainly not evidence of hate or bigotry. It's no occasion for name calling. So that's basically what I have to say about these allegations. I don't think that there's any warrant for sanctioning me. I don't think that the charges against me 
have any valid basis. I am defending them to the best of my ability. And I can only hope that I am vindicated and that the broader purposes for which I am fighting these charges, which is to defend the integrity of free speech and free inquiry within the university and exposure and airing of the full range and diversity of ideas ends up being preserved and vindicated. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Wex. And so now we have a couple questions that were submitted. Also, um, please, anyone in the audience, you're welcome to raise your hand at this point, and we will call on you to unmute yourself. I will start with the written question, though. Um, and I apologize in advance for any mispronunciation of names. Robert Vitalis says, you no doubt noticed that John Zimmerman has revised his views on this case in print based on the Northwestern Dean's report that identified specific statements to an individual student or to individual students. Was the Dean and Zimmerman, not the New York Times, wrong? Well, they have to identify those specific statements that they're basing, that Jonathan's basing his revision on. My understanding is that he was completely focused on this one statement that I allegedly made uh, where I told a student, you know, you you benefited from affirmative action. I don't know why I said that to her, when I said that to her, what the context was, nothing, no information was given to me and I deny mm -hmm. saying it. Uh, I know of no other statement uh, that Jonathan Zimmerman uh, focused on. He seemed to be obsessed with that one statement as, you know, some egregious act. Uh, that was my understanding. I've been, uh, I have been teaching law for 30 years. One statement, a statement that I never made. Uh, that's it. I, I call that grasping for straws. <laughs> And um, John Zimmerman, if you would like to respond, you're welcome to, but you're by no means obligated to. Um, the next question is from John Horton. Um, this is about as classic an example of a quote unquote hellish work environment as it gets. Is this um, adequate grounds for a harassment suit against Penn and the Dean? Well, that may be the case. Uh, certainly, it's been discussed by me and my my lawyers. Uh, and, you know, that's one of the claims that's on the table. I'm actually, uh, I'm not ruling it out, but I'm reluctant to file a harassment claim. Uh, because even though uh, certainly Penn has tried to make my life as miserable as possible, and they have done it deliberately, and of course, the whole time that this is happening, I've also been treated for uh, a very serious illness and they've cut me no slack for that. So I probably have an independent Americans with Disabilities Act claim. Um, I really think that we all in academia have to have a very high tolerance for uh, the rough and tumble uh, of, of different opinions, uh, different points of view for conflict uh, and, you know, I would like to personally display that high tolerance myself because I advocate it for other people, for students, for my fellow faculty. And so I think the threshold for claiming harassment should be very, very high as a general matter. So I would prefer not to focus on that. I would prefer the focus to be on the fundamental tenets and principles of academic free expression, of the protections accorded by free speech doctrine and of all the virtues uh, that flow out of that. That is what I am here to defend. I try to keep my eye on that ball. Okay, um, a, a comment from Marisol, Marisol Quintanilla. If we are all held under the same standard that Amy is being held to, there would be no freedom of speech or freedom of conscience. Incredible what she has gone through. I've gone through similar experiences. Thank you, Amy, for sharing. That was just a comment. Um, Michael Weingrad asks, to what extent are these widespread problems in both academia and the media the result of the near elimination of conservatives from um, those spheres? If this is the case, then is the focus on free speech a focus on a symptom rather than a cause? Uh, is, I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. Is that a symptom of conservatives doing what? Um, a symptom of basically 
the underlying cause, which is the lack of conservatives in academia. So is well, free speech just a symptom? Yeah, I mean, the lack of conservatives in academia is both a uh, product and cause. It's both. Uh, conservatives are, you know, it's very hard to be a conservative in academia. I think my case illustrates that uh, in spades. Um, you're, you're harassed, you're constantly under threat, uh, you're shunned, you're ostracized, you're accused of all sorts of stuff, uh, you know, every, every sin in the book. Uh, it isn't a terribly pleasant environment to be in, and people just get tired of it. Um, it's also very hard for the students, and they will tell you that. I hear from students on a regular basis about uh, what they go through and what they experience. Um, so there, yes, we are lacking a critical mass of conservatives in academia. There is no question about that. Um, and what to do about it is not clear. Academia is a self-perpetuating, self-enclosed, self-reinforcing um, uh, institution. Uh, it is very well funded. Uh, it is very arrogant. Uh, it is, especially in the private side, it is very hard to reform. Uh, and of course, it is the gateway to upper middle class life uh, for the students. So parents and donors and others who might not like what's going on, uh, they kind of look the other way because they want uh, their kids and their grandkids to have the benefits. So uh, it's a tough situation. There's no ready solution, but you know, at some point people need to talk about what can be done about it. Thank you. And next I want to give, there are still some questions that were submitted that we have not answered yet. I do want to give Jonathan, Jonathan and Zimmerman the opportunity to respond. He doesn't have to. No, he's raised his hand. Not the bully pulpit of the Philadelphia Inquirers though. Huh. Yeah. Can, uh, can, can you hear me? Hello? Yes. Yes, yes. yes you can. Um, first of all, um, uh, uh, Amy, I know that you've been ill, and I hope you're feeling better, and that's more important than everything else that's going to follow. Um, well, I'm not, Jonathan, but nobody at Penn cares, okay? Maybe you do, but nobody I do. else. I do. Um, secondly, I want, to, I want to thank you for coming on the air. And I want to thank you for um, being as outspoken as you've been about any number of different issues. And I think it's hugely important that people uh, who identify as conservative or right wing have a voice on campus. I agree with you that very often they don't. Um, and I'm really uh, glad that you're speaking out and I admire it. Um, uh, with respect to these comments that were allegedly made in class, note I said allegedly because I wasn't present for any of these comments, and in all of my written work, I've always said if they occurred or if they occurred as in the report. And I do want to go back to the comment to the student, the alleged comment about affirmative action, because Amy, in your earlier remarks, you're the lawyer, not me, but it sounded a little to me like the broken pot defense, like, you know, your honor, my client didn't steal the pot, and by the way, it was broken. So you're saying, I didn't say this, or I don't remember saying it, but if I did, why is it so bad? I'd like to suggest that, first of all, I think you're right that perhaps we've exaggerated how, quote, bad it is. And in no way do I think anyone should face us uh, like, quote, major sanction for a comment like that. But if the comment was made in the way that, that's reported, I'd like to suggest that it is something that we should uh, or let's just say negatively assess, and here's why. Um, as I would imagine, you didn't see all the admission files of the year that that person applied. Is it plausible that she was admitted because of her race? Absolutely. It is absolutely plausible. Yeah. You're right about that. But it seems to me that unless you saw both her file and all the other files of all the people that applied, you do not know that, in fact, she was admitted because of, quote, affirmative yeah. action. So leaving aside the question of whether it occurred and going back to the broken pot, it seemed to me what you were saying is that if it did, there's nothing wrong with it. And I'd like to su suggest that there is something wrong with it because you didn't actually know that it was true. Okay, well, first of all, as a lawyer, 
I would introduce you to the concept of arguing in the alternative, which lawyers do all the time, right? I didn't do it, but even if I did, here's why it's not nearly as big a deal as Penn is trying to make out. Uh, and, you know, there, there's more involved here than, than that. It's a, there's a broader issue, which is uh, Penn is relying on primarily my extramural speech, and it's kind of desperate to find stuff that I actually said to, to students. Uh, this is one of the only things they've really got, so they've got to make it look really bad. Right now, once again, I deny saying it. I wouldn't say anything so pointed and absolutist to a student, and it's very revealing that I never have before or since. Right, this just isn't my way. Now, you know, you make a point to say flat out you got in because of affirmative action. Yeah, that's making an assumption that you don't have, you know, the best evidence for. But I would submit that it's not just plausible that any given minority got into a highly competitive Ivy school because of affirmative action. It is highly probable, right? It is highly probable based on data that we have, based on data that the schools themselves have submitted in various cases, right? Where they say without affirmative action, the number of blacks would be minuscule. On a, on a, on a race-blind, meritocratic basis, we wouldn't have anywhere near the diversity that we have now. So I guess we have to take their word for it. So we have, yes, this slippage between absolutely you benefited from affirmative action, and it's highly, highly probable that you did, right? And that margin, I guess, is worth something. Uh, so I wouldn't defend the absolutist statement, but I would say it's good enough for government work. Perhaps it was infelicitously expressed and should have been qualified. But the mm. notion that it works some kind of grievous trauma is phony. I've not interviewed this student, but here's a question that I would like to ask her and I plan to ask her. Are you in favor of affirmative action? Do you think it's a good thing? If you think it's a good thing, why is it so awful to think that you might have gotten a boost from it? So what this illustrates is no matter how irrational, no matter how inconsistent, no matter how hyper-emotional a student's response is, we have to defer to it. We can't question it. We can't correct it. We can't challenge it. That's the rule that prevails in the Ivies today. Professor Zimmerman, would you like to respond or would you like me to move on to a different questioner? Well, I'd just like to say one other thing, which is I agree with the distinction between the extramural and the classroom behavior. And that's what I've tried to emphasize in my own writing. And my concern is that the extramural statements, especially the one about politics, about things like immigration, affirmative action, they absolutely must be protected, whether ANIWAC says them or anybody says them, because that's the only way that we learn. Um, uh, the only way we learn is to protect everybody's right to participate in those political discussions. But the classroom is different. I think even Amy would admit Not that- I didn't cool. make this in the classroom. She doesn't even allege I made it in the classroom. Let's be clear about that. This was not an in-class conversation. Right. Let's be very right. clear about but, that. But, but the, the, um, the alleged comment about uh, uh, it's good to have an American name, I believe- No, that, that, that was, was not in a classroom. Name. That was at a, a, some kind of social event mm -hmm. outside the classroom. Let's be very clear about that. No right. allegation that that's in the classroom. Right, right. But 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 it, it, it was it was an event where you're acting as the professor and they're the students. And Unclear. I wasn't given the details on this event. No details. Right. right. Well, well, if it was, I mean, my only point here is that. Well, if it was. All of us, yeah. Right. All of us. We can had some cheese. All, all of us can imagine statements that we might make as professors that would be inappropriate and sanctionable in the classroom. Right. Um, I think it's important to make that distinction. There are things we would say in the public square that should be absolutely protected, but things in the classroom, they're different um, because you have a different set of responsibilities there. Um, so I, um, I, I, 
I, I guess my concern with the Ruger report was that, to use a metaphor uh, from our own ethno-religious uh, uh, background, that it mixes the milk and the meat. It strikes me, it strikes me that the extramural, the political statements of the public sphere should be absolutely protected no matter what they are. But in the classroom um, or in your official capacity as a professor, it seems to me that there are a different set of duties and a different set of constraints. And it seems to me that going right back to the 1915 statement on academic freedom, that distinction has been central to the entire discussion. I mean, if you look at the statement, it, it says explicitly that it says, we're not saying you should be able to do anything that you want or say anything you want in the classroom. You have a different set of duties there. And it seems to me that all of us should be doubling down on that distinction. Right. And Jonathan, I mean, this is hypothetical. Yeah. Uh, even these these incidents that I have just talked about, the three, which I call, you know, in school incidents, none of them were in the classroom. I at this point, I don't know if they have any in class statements that they I am alleged to have made their their allegations are such a jumble they are such a mess uh, they are so unprofessionally put forward I have no idea what they're accusing me of uh, their their pre-hearing submission which is their latest submission is totally vague uh, they they won't tell me what allegations they're taking seriously and what allegations they're not. I mean, it's it's really a, a disgrace. Um, so as far as I know, they're not accusing me of any in-class statements. Uh, statements I made at an academic panel, that strikes me as something that ought to be given the same treatment as extramural statements. I was invited to present these arguments. They've now been personalized as a solipsistic attack in retrospect by my professor. I mean, that doesn't strike me as on the same level as in-class statements. I 100% agree with you that when we're teaching a class, we have to be held to a higher standard and take extra care. But I have never violated that standard. And, and let, me, let me just repeat, I hope you feel better. I'll go quiet now, but that's the most important thing. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Zimmerman. Uh, so we have so many questions. Both people have their hands raised as well as submitted. Um, let's go to um, Ben Poser, who's had his hand up for quite some time now. Uh, ben, are you able to speak? Oh, I had to unmute myself. <laughs> okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So, You'll have to um, speak up, though, because I'm deaf in addition to everything else. Okay, my, my <laughs> condolences. But um, I'm, I very much enjoyed what you had to say. I feel for you. Um, I uh, I'm wanted to see this for a while, but I'm I was asked to come here by a dear friend of mine who was also canceled, who's a professor of music theory at the UNT named Tim Jackson. I don't know if you know him. And he, okay, but he's a fan of you. Um, and I won't go into what happened to him, but uh, I wanted, I was interested in the Penn's, the, the Penn uh, speech code, the Penn diversity uh, statement. And I read something about it being called compelled speech. And I wanted to know what you thought about that, where you think we're going in this particular situation with these kinds of speech codes, and these kinds of diversity statements, the commitment to DEI or DEAI as it apparently is now. Um, and um, uh, if there's any hope for us to fight against it, uh, given what's happened to you, given the aesthetic quality of the evidence they have against you, if you want to call it evidence. Um, so that's basically my question there. So and I'm very grateful that you're giving this talk today. Thank you. Okay, well, um, I'm not aware that Penn has a formal requirement to profess fealty to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, I'm not, you know, I don't know of any such. I do know that my dean has uh, stated, or I've heard stated uh, by people at Penn, that uh, the mission and values of the university 
is to promote diversity, inclusion, and equity. That is the mission and values of the university. And here is my view of that. The university is not entitled to any mission or any values that would have the effect of in any way penalizing uh, or uh, demoting uh, any member of the university who openly disagrees with the uh, mission of diversity, inclusion, and equity. Everybody at the university has to be entitled to be critical of what is known as the DIE agenda. And I am, uh, I am one of those people. I happen to think that the DIE agenda, as they define it, and of course it's very vague at times, is completely inconsistent with a commitment to free speech and inquiry on campus. The two cannot be reconciled, right? So, uh, frankly, I think that the whole DIE commitment uh, needs to go or it needs to be confined uh, to a kind of vague general statement, uh, which certainly, you know, has no effect or does in, in no way circumscribes individuals position that they don't like it and they don't agree with it. Now, I think as a uh, corollary to that, the whole DIE apparatus should be dismantled and abolished. It does nothing but mischief. It serves no useful purpose. In fact, all it does is undermine the proper mission of the university. So uh, I would be in favor of getting rid of all DIE officials, all DIE offices. Uh, and I know that there are a lot of other people who agree with me on that. Thank you. May, may I respond briefly? Yes, please. Okay. Um, the, 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 the professor took a while. I'm, I just don't want to assume I'm entitled to the same amount of time. Um, but uh, thank you for saying that. But uh, I see you're laughing, which is nice. But the, the thing for me is um, because my friend Tim is involved actually in a lawsuit against his university. And uh, I think the Society for Music Theory as well for canceling him for a, a thing I won't go into. Um, and, uh, and he thinks he's a good chance, but he's in Texas. Uh, but the issue for me is uh, having been to college, I'm a class of Brandeis 2016. So I was there at the height of the first Black Lives Matter and everything. Um, I was in classic, so I was lucky I got to hide. But the, the issue for me is, is there any legal chance that we have a handhold here? S certainly in blue states. I mean, is there any, in theory, obviously, these, D these DEI programs or DEAI, because we all need access to insanity, do these things, is there any legal way we can get a handhold here? Because yeah. you're the lawyer here, I'm not. My dad's a lawyer, but I'm not. I just play one at home. And um, okay. well, that's the very, same Yeah, and very briefly, I think we have to divide the landscape into two parts. There are state-sponsored schools, and they are an arm of the government, and they are governed by the First Amendment to the Constitution, which is a very powerful tool, right, for repelling the imposition of orthodoxy and viewpoint discrimination, and I wish that it was used more often, it has been used effectively in some instances. And of course, we have Governor DeSantis, who was a hero of mine, uh, trying to, I think, um, use his power, his fiscal power, uh, to um, limit the kind of discrimination, viewpoint discrimination that is going on in the state university system. Uh, so there's also the power of the purse for these state schools. But when it comes to private universities, you have a much uh, tougher road to hoe here because private universities are not subject to the First Amendment. People often protect that. They say, well, what about your free speech rights? And I say, well, you know, I don't have any from the U.S. Constitution. The only ones I have are through my contract with Penn and my tenure, my tenure contract. And there are very good arguments that I do have uh, free speech and free expression protections through my tenure contract because Penn and many other universities have 
uh, made statements and made promises to provide protection that is very First Amendment-like and have sort of voluntarily taken on the constraints of the First Amendment uh, in many instances, and that becomes part of my contract. But it's a different legal theory, right? And in some ways, it's harder to pursue than the First Amendment theory. So there are, the bottom line is, there are legal avenues. They're somewhat different in different contexts. Uh, but really, I think the most important thing is the strong conventions and understandings and commitments that have built our universities into what they are. And we all need to realize that without a commitment to free expression and free inquiry and the opinions that we hate and information that we find distasteful or unpleasant, the university will decline and collapse, right? So that, that commitment and that understanding is very important. And unfortunately, that is missing among many of our young people who have been miseducated. And even more distressingly, it is missing among many of the people who run our universities. Put it mildly. Thank you. Right, to put it mildly. I'll shut up now. Um, next question is from Daniel Gordon. How do you see the relationship between academic freedom and free speech? Do you think speech is protected by, do you think your speech is protected by both or primarily by free speech, which is, I believe, a more libertarian concept? Well, I think academic freedom is a more professional concept with more limits. Well, once again, I mean, as a legal matter, you know, I, I don't have technical free speech protections through the Constitution. Uh, I only have them if my university voluntarily takes on a commitment to uh, something like free speech, First Amendment legal protections. And there are statements in the record uh, that I can point to where my university uh, has done that. Um, but I think the primary protection, certainly if you're within the private university, is through these conventions of academic free inquiry uh, and academic expression, and they have a long pedigree. Uh, there are, uh, the American Association of University Professors has issued a statement uh, that such principles should apply. Uh, there are various uh, committees that have been formed that have issued statements, various reports, the Woodward Report, the Calvin Report. There's a whole track record here. Uh, they are not technically legally binding. Some of them are, others are not. Uh, but they are, I think, what we have to look to uh, as a guide. Um, let me say one more thing about this. There is an easy fix that Congress could introduce uh, that would solve a lot of these problems, at least if they were properly executed uh, by a, um, an administration that had the will to do it. Every university in this country, save a few, gets huge amounts of federal money. Right? Millions and millions of dollars of taxpayer money are used to support these institutions. There is a law, the Civil Rights Act, Title VI, that says that institutions that get federal money cannot discriminate on the basis of race, sex, etc. And Congress could change that law to say and have to adopt the First Amendment in treating faculty and other university members. It could easily add that extra condition for receiving federal funds. And I think that we should all push for that. And that would be a wonderful, powerful tool that people like me could use to protect ourselves from the kind of arbitrary and outrageous and destructive treatment. It's not just you know, to personalize this and say I've been abused is to say this is ominous for the system that someone like me is being persecuted and we could perhaps change the law very easily so that that is less likely to happen. Thank you. And Andrew Von Horn says, you mentioned that the motivation for these charges was disagreement with the conservative views you express in your quote unquote extramural speech. While I don't doubt this is the case, is there direct evidence of this motivation? 
Well, I mean, the continuous nonstop condemnation of my opinions and my statements by my dean and the relentless name calling of me uh, as uh, exemplifying every sin in the book, racist, sexist, homophobic, xenophobic, white supremacist. I mean, I don't think my dean could define white supremacist if his life depended on it. And then, of course, there was a meeting, a secret meeting. Everything is very secret because that's the hallmark of tyranny. A secret meeting my dean had with the students back in 2019 in which he said that it made him sick that I was on the faculty. It really sucked that I was on the faculty uh, in referencing, of course, my position and my views. Uh, so it's very clear that, you know, having opinions outside the very narrow little gray Overton window of what is acceptable in academia is something that uh, elicits a great deal of ire from the likes of my dean. Here is a juicy one from Mike, Mike Weber. If I heard you correctly, you said DeSantis is a hero. Fire contends that DeSantis's Stop Woke Act is unconstitutional and undermines academic freedom and free speech. Do you disagree? Well, I haven't studied the Stop Woke Act. I uh, am about to uh, attend a conference. Well, I, well, I will have to do that. Um, I don't necessarily disagree with you. Once again, I, I have limited knowledge of the particulars of it. Um, I think that uh, in addressing the sort of far left takeover of education, that the principles that should govern uh, for K through 12 are, are very different from what should govern in higher ed. I think there is enormous leeway for uh, governments and governors uh, and officials to control what is taught in K through 12. That's not censorship, that's curricular choice, and that is totally legal and appropriate, uh, and indeed imperative, uh, if we are to address what is going on. In higher ed, it's a little trickier, right? Because we have, for Florida state schools, the, uh, Certainly, we have the First Amendment. And the First Amendment makes it very problematic for governments to dictate what can and cannot be taught uh, in universities. Uh, so that's definitely a limitation. I do agree with DeSantis that the far left progressive woke takeover of the universities is a problem. Uh, it is something that needs to be addressed. It's bad for students. It's bad for professors. It's bad for the country. It's an affront to the citizens of Florida. But I think how to do it and how to do it properly within the constraints of the First Amendment is a big challenge. To me, what is necessary is to find mechanisms to bring balance to the universities, to make sure that the woke ideas and agendas are countered by a counter narrative that is protected and powerful within the universities. And we can have a long discussion about how to effectuate that. I think there are ways, but frankly, I think that is probably a better way to go. But that doesn't detract from my admiration for DeSantis because he knows what time it is, he understands the problem, he takes the problem seriously, He's seeking to address it. Not every uh, choice that he's made is perhaps the best at this point, but it's a work in progress. Thank you for explaining. Um, Owen, Owen Gilbert asks, uh, do you think there is one particular thing that caused them to come after you, something you actually said or did? What role do you think your political views played in them wanting to cancel you? So that last question you have addressed quite a bit, but the question of whether there was maybe one incident that maybe was a catalyst to all of this? Well, I don't know. I mean, I'm just speculating. I tend to be very blunt and very forthright. Uh, and I, you know, I don't sort of shrink in a corner and, and uh, try to, you know, 
talk woke a babble, so they don't like that. Uh, I think the third rail here is race, because race is the beating heart of wokeism, and make no mistake about it, right? And the demand uh, for equal outcomes for all groups, that the representation of every group and every position uh, mirror the underlying population, that, that demand is relentless, uh, it is a constant drumbeat, and I think it is a very dangerous demand. I think it is a demand that doesn't comport with the facts, uh, and I say so. Uh, so I think that, you know, when I talk about the differences among groups, that's when that really raises people's hackles, and that is why they come after me. Uh, there's a... a um new anonymous question that has just popped up that's relevant to this and then i want to go back to people who have patiently had their hands up this anonymous um, person asks um, what would you say to minority pen students who are reluctant to take your classes because they're worried that you might be biased against them well i would say there is not a shred not a single single shred of evidence that anyone can find that i am biased against any student from any group. And I always treat my students fairly. I treat them as individuals. I judge them as individuals. Their fears are unfounded. Their fears are unjustified. And I think that there is a certain obligation to look at the objective facts. I don't think that students should uh, just go by their feelings alone. Uh, and I don't think students should be encouraged to indulge their fears and feelings when they are groundless. And in the case of the fear of bias, it is utterly groundless. The opinions that I have are not about them. They have nothing to do with them. I teach my students. I teach my students to the best of my ability. I have had students from every imaginable group in my classes. I have students who have praised me, written in my support, uh, who I socialize with uh, on a regular basis. I have kind of a pastoral role for, for students and for right-leaning students at Penn that I actively pursue, and it's quite time-consuming, and it's my privilege to do that. Uh, I have Asian students who have sought me out. I have black students, Hispanic students who have sought me out who are unhappy with the, uh, the orthodoxy on campus who are dismayed by the culture war. I would say I'm contacted every week or two by someone in the university and also students outside the university uh, from groups of every stripe. So I say, come on into my class and judge for yourself. You might learn something. Thank you. And now I want to bring it back over to some people who patiently have their hands raised. Um, Sean Kelly, you've had your hand raised for quite some time. Thank you for your patience. I think I just lost Sean. Just put his hand down. Um, okay, I will move on to somebody else who has their hand raised. Um, Jonathan Burke. I think as soon as you unmute yourself, you will be good to go. Hi, Amy. Uh, nice to hear. Nice to see you again. Um, the question I have for you is uh, related to what happened at the Stanford Law School, and in particular, the memo the Stanford dean wrote to the students, which I actually thought was a was a phenomenal document, especially given that environment and that. Um, do you? I, I could not imagine the, the pen dean writing such a letter. <laughs> to the extent, do you think that this is a, 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 a like a watershed event that people, you know, are, are beginning to get some uh, sense of what, you know, so, so, some sense of reality again? Well, I'm cautiously encouraged by uh, Jenny Martinez's, Dean Martinez's letter from Stanford. It has a lot of good stuff in it. I, I would have liked it to be even stronger than it was. Uh, I'm encouraged by the formation of a committee just reported in the New York Times today of faculty at Harvard 
that wants to recommit to free speech, uh, to what happened at Cornell recently, where the president of the university and others unequivocally rejected the requirement of giving trigger warnings. So there are developments that indicate that we're moving back towards a stronger, firmer, uh, more fervent commitment to fundamental free speech and free inquiry commitments. I will tell you that that is not happening at Penn and Penn Law. My dean is moving in exactly the opposite direction. His indictment against me is a total and complete repudiation of any commitment to free inquiry or free speech. Total, all right? The man cannot credibly claim to believe in those, uh, those principles and do what he's doing to me, all right? There are people at Penn uh, including, you know, some of our overseers, some of our faculty who seem to regard free speech as some, you know, quirky fetish of white people that they need to get over. They, they think, you know, those are, that's, that's something that's standing in the way of utopia. And I see my dean as one of the people among them. Now, my hope is that the faculty committees that are looking at my case will see his charges for what they are, we'll look out in the world and see that other schools are moving in a completely different direction. Uh, that's my hope. But, you know, who knows? There's still a lot of academia that could care less about this stuff. It's a struggle for the heart and soul of our universities, and it's taking place right now. And I can tell you, that if I am fired or disciplined or lose my case, right, that is of greater significance than what is happening with shouting down of speakers. That is a total sea change that is very, very ominous for protections for viewpoint diversity and the full range of ideas. Thank you. And next, um, Matt Morielli has had his hand up. I'm going to go ahead and allow him to speak. Matt, you should be all set as soon as you unmute yourself. Looks like we're having maybe technical issues. Um, so Matt, as soon as you're um, able, please go ahead and unmute yourself. In the meantime, I will take- um, oh, Okay, I think okay. it worked. There you go, yep. Okay. We can hear I you. apologize. Uh, thank you, Professor Wax. I had a question. Um, I'm curious from your legal perspective. Uh, you know, equities had this long ancient historical definition right, that's still commonly used in our, our legal discourse, but it seems like in higher ed, the prominence of equity is used in a different way. It has a different definition. Um, and I was wondering if you had any thoughts on that, if a lot of the contemporaneous definitions of equity in higher ed, higher ed are compatible with kind of the classic definition of legal equity. And maybe just, you know, if you had any other thoughts about when a, when a term like equity that has a common usage is then redefined either in a mission statement or in policies and, and misapplied, is, is there any kind of contractual or legal um, course of action to, to challenge that? Or? Well, I mean, this idea of equity, which seems to have just completely taken over, not just in academia, but in other uh, parts of society, which is uh, everybody's entitled, every group is entitled to equal outcomes by hook or by crook, uh, by whatever means necessary, including discrimination. I mean, we have Ibram Kendi saying uh, the way to get rid of discrimination is more discrimination. The way to get rid of racism is more racism, right? That sort of stuff. Uh, that, that has been long in the making. Uh, ever since the enactment of our anti-discrimination laws in the mid 60s, uh, there has been this, or soon thereafter, there has emerged this theory of disparate impact, which is discrimination encompasses not just 
treating someone differently because of race, targeting their race directly, but uh, disparate outcomes which cannot otherwise be justified and explained. And that is behind the legal theory of disparate impact. Now, until recently, disparate impact was kind of a sideshow. It wasn't used very much. Uh, the disparate impact claims were hard to prove because there were defenses. But now this idea of presumptive discrimination for unequal outcomes has moved into the universities and our institutions as sort of a fundamental item of faith that we must engineer equal outcomes. And then in order to do that, we have to abandon every other principle that is behind our anti-discrimination regime, including colorblindness, including the meritocracy, including uh, trying to achieve equal opportunity, including of course, all of the virtues of individual effort, individual hard work, the whole panoply of bourgeois values, the whole nine yards. Um, so it, there has been a kind of metastasis of this idea, uh, a takeover, shall we say. Uh, but, you know, it's not of recent vintage. It's been percolating for a while. Um, once again, you know, what can we do about it legally? Uh, I'm not sure that we can force institutions uh, to abandon that, except by using the very laws that we enacted in the first place. You know, the laws are quite explicit. The, uh, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, it says there shall be no discrimination because of or on the basis of or due to race. That's pretty clear. It doesn't discriminate, doesn't distinguish between whites and blacks, different sorts of groups. It, it doesn't say, well, you can do that in order to engineer equal outcomes. It doesn't say anything like that. Uh, so I would say go back to the source and use the tools and the instruments uh, that we have. Um, that really is all we can do. Uh, once again, we have Title VI, and I want to go back to Title VI. It says, if you take federal money, you cannot discriminate on the basis of race. I would say that that is happening all over the place. Certainly it's happening in affirmative action. The question of that, whether that will be allowed is now before the courts. So these battles are being fought out on the original meaning of the laws. They are being fought out today. Thank you. And next, I want to quickly ask a question that was emailed to me by a professor who um, very much wanted to be here. I'm not going to share her name because I did not get her permission. Um, so just be safe. She says, I don't believe in Amy Wax's defense that she's being quote unquote canceled by the forces of quote unquote wokeness. I would have believed her if these accusations had occurred one to three times scattered upon the decades. Yet the accusations are not that they are everywhere. I read the University of Pennsylvania's letter on Ms. Wax, and there are too many accusations. Maybe there is a conspiracy plot at hand, but I do not believe in conspiracies, just like I do not believe in coincidence. Um, perhaps I am woke, whatever that means, but I'm a strong believer in the First Amendment, including the right to free speech. Yeah, I don't believe speech is, is any longer, quote unquote, free when violence, the potential for violence or death and or death or death is among it. You don't shout, you shouldn't, or you can't shout, fire in a um, packed, packed theater when there's no fire. People will flee and trample each other and someone will get hurt or die. Well, I mean, this is kind of a very diffuse question, so I'm not really quite sure how to answer it, but I think I would only say this. Accusations are easy to make. Objective proof and evidence for those accusations, now that's something else entirely. That's really hard. And up until this point, we have not, as a society, as a legal system within law schools, just said, an accusation is enough. We don't need any more. We have said, aha, but an accusation needs to be proven. Now, you know, make no mistake, the wokeistas want to get rid of that rule. 
Their ultimate agenda, and my case is just a part of that broader agenda, is to bring down our entire system of safeguards. You may think I'm exaggerating, but I'm absolutely not, right? Of proof, of evidence, of rigor, of logic, of consistency, of due process, of the adversary system, all of those wonderful elements that have been built up over centuries, all of those safeguards, mm -hmm. all of those precious uh, parts of our glorious legal system, which is the envy of the world, their goal is to demolish it. Why? Because it's a racist, patriarchal cover for oppression, for persecution, for whiteness, for everything that is evil in the world, right? If you read the woke, the woke babble that is written, you know, daily in our newspapers, in our publications, and in academia, nobody makes a secret of this. We need to get rid of the entire system. We need to bring it down. We need to dismantle it. So, you know, that's, that's what I have to say about it. If you say, well, an accusation is enough, and if you pile up the accusations, that's enough, then you are part of that project. And next, um, Stephen Kirshner has had a series of questions over time, so I apologize we haven't gotten to all of them. I want to kind of put them all together because they're pretty similar thematically. Um, first, he says, your case is outrageous. There are similar cases involving Princeton, um, Francis Cohen, uh, Central Florida, Negi, um, Cleveland State, uh, Pesta, and Hanlon University. That's um, Elizabeth Lopez Prater. He also says there were embarrassing events at Yale and Stanford Law. To what extent do you think affirmative action and the emphasis on diversity is leading to loss of free speech and the transparent viewpoint discrimination? I'm um, also just uh, add to it his other questions just so you can kind of um, respond to all of them at once here. And I'm sorry, Stephen, that it's taken so long to get to these questions. They're um, all important. New question. Uh, is it important that you sue Penn Law and Dean Regert um, as a deterrent for universities to trample on faculty free speech. And his last comment is qualified immunity should not be used to insulate administrators who know that they're trampling on faculty free speech and academic freedom rights. Um, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> you say, please ignore my earlier questions. Uh, I'm very sorry, Stephen. I'm getting to these like kind of as I'm going. So um, I guess he's okay with you um, passing on those earlier questions. Um, Stephen, please indicate if you would like her to respond. Um, but I assume this last question is important that you sue Penn Law and Dean Rugger as a deterrent for universities to trample on faculty free speech. I assume that question you'd still like to have answered, Stephen. Uh, well, there's a lot of questions here. Uh, I'll, I'll start with suing Penn. Um, I am committed to seeing through this set of allegations against me. I think one of the things that's happened that's unfortunate is people who are uh, attempted to be canceled, like me, um, who the university is determined to get rid of, life is made so miserable for them that they just kind of throw up their hands and quit. I don't blame them personally for that, not at all. Many of them are younger than I am. They have families to raise. Uh, they have to think about their financial well-being and the like, so I don't once again, I don't blame them, but I really think that the tactic uh, that we ought to use, if we at all can, is to stay the course and to fight these efforts. And, you know, I'm hoping that Penn will not, you know, issue any adverse decision against me uh, and that things will turn out the way they should. But if they do, I fully intend to uh, go to court. Uh, and challenge Penn and stay the course there, however long it takes. Luckily, I have people supporting me, donors, a very able law firm. Um, I have the wherewithal to do that, and I am determined to do it, however long it takes. Uh, and we'll see how it turns out. Penn is a very powerful and rich institution. Uh, they're ruthless. They are unprincipled, uh, and they will do everything they can to wear you down. 
Um, that has been my experience so far. There is nothing that has happened that changes my view of things. I'm sorry to have to issue such a harsh judgment, but there it is. Um, so that's, that's the deal. Uh, now you asked something about affirmative action. Um, affirmative action, I think, is one of the original sins uh, that has led to a lot of what's going on in the university now and the suppression of free speech. I think there is a straight line from affirmative action to this whole diversity, equity, and inclusion monstrosity that we've built, that has entrenched itself, to the suppression of uh, adverse opinions, opinions people don't like. Why is that? Because with affirmative action, we really have enshrined, we necessarily enshrine a double standard uh, for admission, for promotion, for all sorts of goodies uh, in the university. We have to abandon a single standard. And the reason for that is the reason why we have affirmative action in the first place. Uh, underrepresented minorities, especially blacks, lag behind in academic achievement. Uh, and that's why we need an extra thumb on the scale, a very big extra thumb on the scale. Uh, but people are just reluctant to actually admit that. Uh, and once the affirmative action beneficiaries get to the university, they don't want to hear from other people uh, that their credentials are less strong. Uh, that they are, you know, less qualified, quote unquote, depending on how you define that. So the powers that be have to censor that sort of talk and they have to manipulate that sort of talk to, uh, to protect the uh, self-image and the amour propre of the beneficiaries. And then, of course, we build these monstrous uh, institutional bureaucracies which are dedicated to uh, trying to paper over uh, the differences that affirmative action, uh, you know, the reason we have affirmative action, the differences, the differences in achievement, the differences in academic skills, which undeniably exist, uh, and to smooth them out and to deny them. Uh, and that DIE establishment is there to push a certain ideology, an ideology about uh, racism and discrimination as the pervasive cause of everything to silence and suppress any alternative theories for why disparities exist. Unfortunately, affirmative action leads to thought control. And that's actually the worst thing about it. I mean, that in itself is the reason to be opposed to it, I think, uh, because it has led to this, this monstrous result. Actually, this is um, not a question that was submitted, but it's just kind of come to my mind as you've been describing this, just because um, you know, people who are more supportive of affirmative action, they, they might respond by saying something like, there are also legacy admissions. There, there are students and donors who would never have gotten in were it not for that advantage. And so presumably their scores would also be well below, well below the average student, certainly well below the average student who doesn't have those. Um, privileges. And so, okay, well, um, you know, I'm not here to defend legacy admissions. That's a legitimate oh, yeah. topic for debate. But I will say this about legacy admissions. And this is once again, one of many instances of inconvenient facts that people don't want to face. It turns out that the number of legacy admissions who seriously lag on academic criteria is very, very tiny. Okay, legacies, you know, tend to come from parents who've gone to the Ivies. On average, they actually do extremely well. Uh, and, you know, they if you look at the numbers, uh, you don't have to really seriously lower standards for the great majority of legacies. That's just, you know, a factual observation. Uh, that still, that doesn't mean that we should give, you know, a tiebreaker to legacies or anything like that. Um, but I just wanted to clarify that. Yeah. Now, do I think that the university is a perfect meritocracy? Of course not. There's no such thing, right? Meritocracy and a single standard uh, for 
you know, finding qualified people, pushing them forward as a principle for our society as a whole, I think is an aspirational ideal. It is a worthy aspirational ideal. It makes for a fairer and better society. It makes for, on average, for more competent people uh, being placed in various roles, uh, which they are suited to for matching people to what they do best. It's good for society. Uh, it's good for institutions. Uh, it tends to promote prosperity. There are all sorts of reasons why we should promote and embrace the meritocracy, in my opinion. That doesn't mean that our meritocracy is perfect, and I would never claim that it is. Yeah. No, thank you for explaining. And um, and, and you're, it's consistent with if the argument is that if students are admitted who actually do have lower scores, and that would create an environment in which censorship becomes a norm in order to try to encourage those students' advancement. If the legacy- well, well put, and much more succinctly than I said it. Uh, I appreciate you bringing it up. There's um, an anonymous attendee um, who says, the ability to use disparate impact analysis was reaffirmed in the Civil Rights Act of 1991 after the Reagan justice ruled in Ward's Cove parking or packing, sorry, um, versus uh, Antonio uh, nine, uh, uh, 490 US uh, 642, 1989. The analysis was not supported by the original Civil Rights Act. Do you advocate striking down the 1990, 1991 Act as unconstitutional, or do you accept the use of disparate impact in employment and other discrimination cases? Well, it's, it's not technically unconstitutional because the Equal Protection Clause, uh, which arguably, you know, mandates colorblindness applies to the government. The disparate impact rule is in the Civil Rights Act and it applies to private action. So, you know, the government, the Congress could pass a rule if they wanted to, and they have, uh, which says, that double standards can be used to effectuate equal results. Um, now, disparate impact and the 1991 Civil Rights Act, uh, that still gives uh, companies and, and institutions that depart from perfect uh, uh, disparities of, of eliminating, um, that don't eliminate disparities, a defense. Um, so it's not that powerful a rule. But the question you're really asking me is, do I approve of the disparate impact rule? Do I think it's a good rule? Do I think it's a good law? Because uh, the law is implicitly now enshrined in the 1991 Civil Rights Act. Uh, the answer to that is, no, I think it's a terrible law. And I've written a whole article about it, right? The dead end of disparate impact it's in a publication called National Affairs, and I explain why I think the disparate impact rule is a bad rule, because there is no good reason to expect that outcomes will be the same for all groups, or that the proportion of people in any role will mirror the population of that group. There is no good reason to expect that. Groups differ on average in their traits, in their talents, in their abilities, in their measured intelligence, whether you like it or not, and for whatever reason, uh, in their academic achievement, in their athletic achievement, in their musical achievement, in every kind of talent and achievement you can imagine. No, groups are not cookie cutter uh, mimics of each other. That is just an empirical falsehood and disparate impact theory is based on that assumption. It is based on a false assumption. I think a law that is based on a false assumption is problematic. Okay. Um, Carolyn Marvin asks, do university statutes give the statutes give the power to sanction tenured faculty members to the faculty senate, if such power is conferred, what offenses are said to be sanctionable and are there limits on what penalties are prescribed? Well, of course, you know, Penn being a judge in its own case, 
Uh, nothing is spelled out. Absolutely nothing is spelled out. Uh, they don't define uh, with any specificity what kinds of behaviors, quote unquote, are potentially sanctionable. Um, they have some detail. I mean, obviously, if you don't meet your academic obligations, uh, if you commit a felony, uh, you know, stuff like that, that's pretty clear. But that non-specificity, that vagueness, is that discretion is precisely what my dean is trying to cynically take advantage of. Uh, the fact that you know there's there's very little detail in the faculty handbook. There are strong conventions. Indeed, one of the issues in my case is that there is a whole grievance apparatus that is specifically delegated any issues that relate to academic freedom. It is completely separate from the faculty senate. There is a commission on academic freedom. There is a senate committee on academic freedom and responsibility. And one thing that is crystal clear, and this is exceptional for the rules that govern Penn, is that my case, which implicates questions of speech and academic freedom, belongs in that process. Only that process has jurisdiction, not the faculty senate. So just ab initio, my dean is running contrary to the rules and abusing the process by sending my case to the faculty senate. He never should have done that. Uh, he should have gone to the grievance committee. So I think there we're on very, very firm ground. And if we ever get to court, that is going to be, I think, a very big issue. Because that's part of my contract. Okay. Uh, Professor Wax, we have time for one last question. And this question, I think, will be relevant to many people in the audience. Um, you have the advantage of being a lawyer and familiar with the legal system. What advice do you have for faculty erroneously accused of charges that violate academic freedom who have much less experience with navigating the legal system? Well, <laughs> luckily, I'm a lawyer. and <laughs> That really does help. And I've practiced law. Uh, and I'm a law professor, so that, that is a big leg up, I must say. I would say um, get a good lawyer and get good legal advice. Understood. Well, thank you very much, Professor Wax. I hope that everyone who's been present has enjoyed this and found it very edifying. I know I certainly did. Um, if anyone has any follow-up um, questions, please feel free to email me. Um, I'm happy to convey anything to Professor Wax. Um, also, Professor Wax, your email is, I believe, publicly available. So if anyone has questions that they were not able to ask, um, they don't want to speak on behalf of you, but um, I get the impression that uh, you're happy to discuss further. Sure. Thank you for having me. This was very uh, interesting and, and very helpful to me. I'm glad. Well, thank you. And thank you, everyone.